this series, Never the Same. We're in this series, Never the Same. And I got a whole lot of notes, but I just don't feel like this service requires all of it today. The good news about having three services, I got three chances. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somewhere between all three, we may get the whole message. I'm not sure. While you're turning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, I, this week has been very interesting to me. Um, your, your faithful gift, your faithful gift to us over pastor appreciation is very important to, to steward well. Uh, my brother-in-law, he used this illustration to me very casually, but it, it resounded in me. It was a parable of the talents. One was given one, one was given five, one was given ten. All were required for increase. So it was very important for, for him and I to get that seed that you've sown into our life into the ground as quickly as possible. So we took a couple of days. Over the last couple of days when we've dealt with the, your, our stewardship of your seed into our future, I, I've spent, I spent multiple days coming around people that um, are members of our church that never come through the doors. It's been very interesting over the last several days, the encounters I've had. Oh, yes, we watch you every Sunday. Oh, yes, we're a part of Judah. At the end of the service last night at the youth conference, I had this uh, lady. She was probably in her, I don't know, she's, she looks younger than me, but she's got to be older. Which at this stage in my life, because of all y'all, it, it doesn't take a lot to look older than me. Because y'all stress, never mind. <clears throat> I'm really 25. Do you see what ministry has done to me? stupid this lady comes up to me and and she she's touching me and touching me she she okay she's latina okay so the fact she's touching me and not cutting me i know i'm in a good place y'all y'all some of y'all don't know and, and she was touching me and you know and she feels very connected she said you don't know me but i but my son and i are members of your church and i'm like well it's nice to meet you she said, we've never been through the doors, but we watch every week, and then at, throughout the week, we'll watch the services multiple times. And That was just last night, and it's amazing to me what God is doing and how God is speaking, pastors and leaders and, and different people, and then just people that are, as they're preparing to be used by God in their ministries, are, are watching and are part of what we're doing here. What we do matters. And part of, part of this week, I'm saying all this for a point, I promise. Part of this week, we had to, um, we had to go uh, to, towards the beach. Now, I'm going there for business. My wife is going for pleasure. And uh, we were just going to drive down, sign some documents, do this thing. And she goes, honey, let's stay. And I'm like, baby, I got a whole lot to do. <laughs> I know, let's stay. And I'm like, you don't understand. I'm the head of this house. And I have decided at the head of this house that we're going to do whatever you want to do. <laughs> and so, you know, so, I, so we, we stayed for a couple of days, and, and I'm, I'm, on this, I'm on this journey with the Lord in, in, in relation to my personal health. And every day I spent four, between four and five miles every day walking the beach. And, and what I heard the Lord say to me over and over again was this one question. Will, will you go first? Will you go first? Will you go first? Will, will Judah go first? Will you go first? There's a wave of glory. There's a wave of power. There's a wave of revelation. There's a wave of healing. There's a wave of signs. There's a wave of wonders. And not a wave of weirdness. But supernatural manifestation. And, and I'm looking, look, watch this, this is not special to Judah Church, but I believe that God is setting up regional revivals all around our nation. And the question that I kept hearing the Lord ask me all week long was this one question, will Judah go first? Will Judah go first? Will we be willing to pay the price to unlock something in this region that this region has been prophesied over for decades? Is Judah willing to pay the price to go first? It's a conversation. And in... 
We can say yes, or we can live a yes. This, by the end of this day, well, I, I will have preached five times within 48 hours. They did a study that said the stress and strain on one's body in a 50-minute message is equivalent to eight hours of work with stress and strain. This will be the fifth time I've done it within 48 hours. And the Lord says, will you go first? I could not walk in here tired. I had to give him everything. So I, I didn't feel like praising, but I had to praise him until I felt like praising did you hear what I said? I, I felt like sitting, but I knew if I sat, you know, a body in motion stays in motion, and a body that sits will sit. So I didn't wait to feel like praising to praise. I decided I was going to praise him whether I felt like it or not. And little by little, I would praise until I felt like praising. And the question the Lord has asked me over and over again this week is, will Judah go first? I... I if the Lord allows me, I'm going to preach a message that he gave me Friday. This is different than, than what our notes were and our, our direction was. And, and the simple question that we must answer today is simply this. Where's the fire? Where's the fire? In the, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is telling a parable of the kingdom. And he says that there's ten virgins. They were all pure. They all wanted to be married, and they all had kept themselves for that wedding night. They all had a desire for the bridegroom. They all had made preparation for that bridegroom. But the issue is, as the night got darker and the bridegroom tarried longer, they were not prepared to sustain themselves or the fire that was required during the dark time to create illumination and warmth. And they were not prepared to walk it out as long as it took. They were willing to pay a price, but they were not prepared to pay the price for as long as it takes. And there are too many of us that want God to move in our life, but we're not willing to have a as long as it takes pursuit. Somebody asked me as a very young minister years ago, they said, Pastor, what will it take for us to be whatever their version of success was? And my immediate response was, it's real simple. What's it going to take? It's going to take everything. It's going to take everything to do what it is that God's called you to do. It's going to take the good times and the bad times. It's going to take the people that gather with you and the people that walk away. It's going to take the people that are going to hold your heart together and then the people that are going to break your, part of, your heart apart. It's going to take it all. If you're going to fulfill God's purpose for your life, it takes the good and the bad. It takes the rain on the just and in the seasons of unjust. He takes it all, and that's what it takes. These five particular virgins have now watched the oil drain and the fire go. Mm. If there's... If, all of a sudden, they were gathered together as ten virgins, but an immediate separation has now taken place. That which is lacking oil and that which has oil in abundance. If it's ever been a picture of the church that we see in the United States of America, you are seeing the difference between the five, the ten virgins. You're seeing the distinction of the grouping that's taking place. And it's those that have oil in abundance and those that are watching the flame burn out. Jesus said it this way, that if, if the father tarries too long, that he will hasten the days because even the very elect will fall away. We find it in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse number 8, I believe it is, that the five virgins look to the other virgins, and they say, hey, listen, give us some of your oil. Watch this. For our lamps are going out. One translation says it this way, for the flame is dying. Our flame is dying. Flame that was once ignited has not had enough oil in flow. And now the flame is no longer burning near as brightly as it once did. 
But I believe it is the assignment of God and then the desire of God for this house and the, the individual lives that are connected to this house, both in this room and watching online, listening to the radio broadcast, that there is a desire for the fire of God to remain and to fall and to be ignited and to be sustained in and through our lives, not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesdays, not just on special events, but every day of our life that we have the power to burn for him. It's the fire of God. A couple observations I want to make. I want you to help, help you understand today. Number one, that the fire of God is God. The fire of God is God. We're not talking about God's fire. We don't want God's fire. We want God. Because the fire of God is God. That when you have the fire of God, what you really have is God. And I don't know how you feel, but I don't want a God that can't burn anything up. I don't want a God that doesn't have the power to create illumination and warmth in his presence. When we talk about the fire of God, what we're talking about is God. I don't want just the miracles. I don't want just the signs. But if we get the presence of God in our midst, all of those things will show up. But I don't want his fire. I want him. One thing if I desired, and that one thing I seek, and it is to know. Know him, him alone. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 says that our God is a consuming fire. He doesn't have consuming fire, he is consuming fire. In Malachi chapter 3, verse number 2, the Bible says that who can endure the day that is coming and who can stand before it? Because he is like a refiner's fire. He doesn't have a refiner's fire. His fire does refine. It burns the impurity and shapes the purity. He is a refiner's fire. In Isaiah chapter 4, verse number 4, look at this text. It's one of the powerful ones of text. The Bible says that God's spirit is the spirit of burning. That when you have the spirit of God, you have the spirit of burning. It's the spirit of burning because he is a God that is on fire. He doesn't have just fire to come with him. There are not just moments of fire because the fire of God is God himself been challenged by this over the past several weeks on why does it take all that to be in his presence? And my response to you is, when's the last time you've seen somebody healed? When's the last time somebody's been delivered in your church? Do you have trash cans in your front for people getting set free from d demonic oppression and they have to vomit it out? When's the last time you, oh God, you hear what I'm saying? This is the, I don't know if it takes all that, but I know it takes all that here. And I like the way it is. Come on. <laughs> Matthew chapter 3 tells us that Jesus is coming and he will baptize us in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Ghost, and in fire. Not only is the fire of God confirmation because it is God, but number two, the fire of God is confirmation that God is pleased. All throughout scriptures, you see God receiving the sacrifices of his people, and he comes by way of fire to bring up the sacrifice. You see this very clearly in Leviticus chapter 9, 22 through 24. The people of God brought a sacrifice, and God consumed it, and he consumed it through fire. In Genesis chapter 15, Moses has brought over five animals. He's cut them in half. He put one half over here and one half over here, and God comes down, and he burns it all with fire. He receives the sacrifice. Watch Judges chapter 13, verse 19. I'm going to preach this real good in 2022. The, 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 the son, the, the father of Samson has come in, and he's laid a fire on the altar. He's laid a fire on the rock. And the Bible says in Judges chapter 13 that the angel, capital A, that the angel, Malik Yahweh, that the angel of the Lord, Jesus himself, he comes down in the fire that shoots out of the rock, and he receives the sacrifice. And I love this, that when the angel of the Lord received the sacrifice that the angel, one translation says, shouted. Another translation says that he danced in the fire. I don't know how you feel, but when I bring a sacrifice to God that is pleasing to him, it makes him dance, not just me. Even the heavenly realm shouts and dances in fire. Not only is confirmation that he is God, confirmation that he is, please watch this, but fire is confirmation that he is present. It's confirmation that he's present. 
that he is here. Listen to what he said in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5. He says, for I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. How do you get your life protected from all of the nonsense that's happening in our world today? It's when you come into a place where you have the presence of God in your midst. He'll be a wall of fire. He is the glory and the lifter of our head. He'll be a wall, not just a wall, but a wall of fire around you. The children of Israel are walking through the wilderness, coming out of Egypt into the land of promise, and they're in process called the wilderness. And they were being led by a cloud by the day, but they didn't have to worry about it in that desert air because the heat of the sun kept them warm. But in those dark nights, in those dark, cold, arid nights, that temperature would drop in significant ways. So God would take the cloud, and he would ignite it with oxygen, and it would become a pillar of fire in the nighttime. Why? Because it would be illuminated in dark times, and they could be warmed by the heat that would come off of it. What are you saying? I'm saying in the darkest of our season, in the darkest of this culture, it is time for the fire of God to fall in such a way that it illuminates what's going on in the dark corners of our world. Moses is having an encounter, not just with a bush. It's just any other bush on any other mountain with any other ground connected to it. But when that bush was ignited on fire, everything changed about that place to the point to where God told him, get your shoes off, for the ground you stand is holy. Why? Because the fire was on the bush, and it went down to the roots, and it got down into the, to the soil and the grass that it was connected to, and it made it holy because the fire was there. Because the fire was there. Meanwhile, in the churches of America today, there's no fire in our pulpits. There's no fire in our praise. There's no fire in our worship. There's no fire in our prayer meetings. There's no fire in our Judah kids. There's no fire in our student ministries. There's no fire in our meetings. There's no fire in our... The only thing that has fire is the kitchen because we want to have a bunch of cooking. One of my favorite preachers that I read often, old language, his name is Charles Spurgeon. He said it this way. He said, either put fire in the sermon or put the sermon in the fire. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Put some fire in the sermon or put the sermon in the fire. What is the point if you're not going to have any hot sauce to it? Come on. I don't know how you feel this morning, but I just declare, God, let your fire fall in this place. Let the fire of God fall in this house. Let the fire of God be, let, 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 let it be evident and real. We, we, we pray according to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 16, that you would stir up the gift of God on the inside of us, that you would set ablaze the gift of God on the inside of us, that the fanning of the flame of God would be released in our life. I want to ask you today, where's your fire? Are you fired up about politics? Are you fired up about the economy? Are you fired up about your 401k? Okay. Are you fired up about your favorite team? Are you fired up about what God is able and willing and doing in the earth? Yeah. Hear me today, because it's not just about what God is and what God can do. But hear me, God will send the fire, but it is our job to steward it. He'll send it, but you and I have to steward it. We have to fuel it. We have to feed it. We have to sustain it. See, oh, oh, God have mercy. Can I preach this the way I want to? Most of us want to sit in a soaking when God is asking us for a stoking. We want to be saturated. We want to soak. We want to bask. We want to be deep. We want to be deep for the saying of being deep. And there's time and there's space for all of that. But when the fire of God comes, it cannot be soaked in. It must be stoked. I got to pull. I got to prod. I got to shake. I got to do things that I would not normally do. If I'm going to sustain the fire, it doesn't need my soaking. It needs my stoking. God, I came here expecting you to show up. I came here expecting to see a miracle. I came here because I knew you presence was going to be in this place. Go to dead church if you want to. But my God, you and I must sustain the fire when it falls. Hear the words of Proverbs, Solomon, the wisest man in history. Proverbs chapter 26, verse number 20. Look at the text. It says, where there is no wood. Come on. 
It wasn't the absence of fire. It was the absence of fuel. And I believe one of the reasons why we're such poor stewards is because we've got more skeletons than crosses. We have more skeletons than we have crosses. And so there's a way we live in here, and then there's a way we live out there. And we got more skeletons than we do crosses. But hear me, you can't, oh God have mercy. You, you cannot have a sustained fire without people bringing wood to the equation. And the wood that God requires is your cross that you're bearing. You don't hear what I'm saying. The cross of your purity. The cross of your right attitude. The cross of the lack of gossip. The cross of your prayer. The cross of your praise. The, coming, the continual reasonable sacrifice of worship that we bring into the midst. Those are the fuel. That's the wood that we throw on the fire of God and continue to fan the flame in our lives. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, and he says in verse number five, do not quench. That word means to blanket it, to suffocate it. And if it doesn't happen in the last 10 minutes of our service in the altar, we want nothing to do with the fire of God. Because somewhere along the way, we've decided to entertain people versus his presence. We've decided to be more about our preference than his presence. And so we blanket the Spirit of God. Amen. Meanwhile, the prophet Jeremiah had a fever that there was no ice pack for. Jeremiah had a fever that there was no Tylenol to bring down. The Bible says that Jeremiah said, I don't know how you feel, but it's fire. Shut up in my bones. They told me in my 20s I would calm down in my 30s. When I got to my 30s, I hadn't calmed down. They told me in my 30s that I'd finally get old enough in my 40s. And somewhere in my 40s, I would finally calm down. Well, I'm 46 now, and I don't know how you feel, but I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. I'm a good, it's a moment, it's going to be my one shot on Sunday at 8.30. It's going to be my one shot on Sunday at 10 o'clock. It's going to be my one shot on Sunday at 11.30. It's going to be my one shot on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday. On, I may not have it all together, but I'm going to give him everything I got because he's just been too good to me for me to sit here and not have fire. Yeah. Shut up in my bones. Jeremiah goes on in Jeremiah 5, 14, and he says, listen, we're not only about going to put fire in your bones, but I'm going to put fire on your mouth. I'm going to put fire in your tongue. I'm going to put fire in your words. What good is it to be passionate about a team that doesn't change your situation? Well, I'm just not emotional. You come here, let me punch you. Come on. Find out how non-emotional you are. Let your favorite football, basketball, baseball team lose, and we'll find out how emotional you are. Let, um, here we go. You ready? Let your politician win or lose. We'll find out how emotional you are. Yeah. Let's find out whether you agree or disagree with the verdict that just came out, and we'll find out how emotional you are. Let's read, oh, help me, Holy Ghost, here we go. Let, let me find out whether you agree or disagree with somebody's post about you or your situation. We'll find out how emotional you are. But we don't want to bring the fire into the worship praise. Well, Pastor, I just don't know that we need the fire. Acts chapter 2 tells us that on the day of Pentecost, when he had fully come, they were all gathered in together one place, in one mind, in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound as a rushing mighty wind, but it wasn't enough for being a wind, but clothing tongues of fire set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 24 tells us that the disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus with God, and he begins to tell them about the unveiling of Jesus from the Old Testament all the way into the modern day time. And after Jesus vanquished, he vanished himself from their moment. They looked at each other, and they had Holy Ghost heartburn, and they said, does my heart not burn within me as he began to break open the Word of God? What good is it to have a Bible? What good is it to have the word of God if it doesn't make you want to burn for him on the inside. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, he was in a moment of glory that he was not prepared for. 
The angels come in and they cry one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. It filled up like smoke. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. And his response was, woe, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I'm a part of a generation of uncleanliness. I don't deserve to be in the level of glory and what I'm witnessing. So the angel came down and grabbed a fiery coal from the altar and put it on his mouth. And he cleansed his mouth right there because of the fire that was in the altar the fire that was in the altar where is the fire where's the fire my wife and I have been to Northern California a couple times now anything in Southern California you can have you can have all that I love Northern California in Northern California, they have a couple parks. One of these particular parks is, is the Redwoods National Forest, Sequoias, the, the Redwoods. And they're really unbelievable. There's, there's one particular entrance in, in Northern California in the park where you literally, you drive through. These trees are so massive that you can literally take your vehicle. And we were in a very large conversion van the very first time. I've been there three times. My wife and I, we've been there twice. And, and, and you could literally drive a van. As a matter of fact, we were on a ministry team when I went the very first time. And we had 17 people. And we gathered around one of the trees, 17 of us touching fingers. And we still could not get our arms all the way around the circumference of this one redwood tree massive unbelievable it's unbelievable how big and good God is yeah. one tree was bigger than 17 people's reach in Northern California many years ago they began to have a crisis in Northern California because they had very old trees that were grown to full potential but there was not a new generation that was being birthed underneath them they didn't understand why. Because the acorns, their version of acorns would fall down from off of the trees because every tree produces after its own kind. It produces after its own kind. So the seed, the potential of what could be in the next generation has now been, been dropped and been placed into the place where it can. But the problem is technology got in the way. Back in the old days, a lightning would strike into one of those forests and it would create a fire inside of that. Watch this. Not every area of the forest would burn, but every area of the forest would feel the heat. The problem is in Northern California that all of the air is blowing off of the Pacific Ocean and so there's an incrustation that would begin to happen over top of the seeds as they laid on top of the surface of the soil. The incrustation would encapsulate the seed to the place to where it did not have the ability to get the air and be released in its full potential into the ground. And the only thing that would destroy the incrustation that was around that seed was the fire and the heat that came off of it. But technology got in the way, and the forestry department decided what they were going to do is every time they would see the lightning strike and a fire begin to spark, they would quench it as quickly as possible. Because they did not want everything to burn in the generation that has their strength and power and their visibility in this moment. So they would quench the spirit. Oh, God. So they would quench the fire... Because they, they were okay with a little lightning, but sustained fire produced a lot of heat. And a lot of heat was not good, they thought in their mind. Because all of their technology told them, this is not good to have this much fire. And they realized that there was a generation that was not coming up next. And the ones that were coming up were stunted in their development and their growth. And they realized what they were doing is they allowed technology to overwhelm their intelligence of what God created that when the lightning would strike and the fire would fall in that forest it would be the heat that would burn off the incrustation of the environment it was in it would burn off the incrustation of the environment and the culture that it was in so that it would unlock the fullness of the potential of the next generation coming so what we've done is we've allowed the technology of today to blanket 
The only place, it doesn't matter how many lights you put in here, it cannot compare to the fire's heat. Because if your child, if our children are ever going to have the fullness of the potential of God unlocked on the inside of them, it will not happen because of what technology can do. It will happen because the fire has fell and it has been sustained and the heat has burned off everything in this culture that is not a part of God's plan for their life. Chris Salem died. So, I stood on Mount Carmel where the prophet had overwhelming odds stacked against him in terms of numbers of men. And he looked at them and he said, you call on your God and I'll call on my God. And the one that answers by fire, let's, him, let's let him be God. So, you call on your God, and I'll call on my God. And let the one that answers by fire, if, if politics can bring down the fire, it already would have been. If the economy, if a stimulus check could have brought down the fire, it already would have happened. So it is abundantly clear that you can cut, you can scream, you can do all the things in pagan worship that you want to. But if there is no fire, that is not God. So let's let the God who answers by fire be God. So he said to me, will Judah go first? So as the leader of this house, we've decreed and we've declared never the same. The question is not will Judah go first, the question is will you go first? All week long, I've had to answer the question, will I go? Will I go first? There are people counting on his fire in my life. There are people counting on your fire. They don't have enough faith for fire. Question is, Will you and I pay the price to sustain that kind of glory being revealed and released in this room? That while those that are hurting and wounded and in cold places of service can't build the fire in that moment, they can feel the heat that comes out of here. Or did you just decide that 33 degrees, degrees this morning was cold enough for you to remain cold? That it gave you and I the excuse to not come in here and strike a match of praise. To throw on the log of prayer. To throw on the log of purity. Uh-oh. To even throw on the log of attendance. Was it too cold because you don't have a remote starter in your car? Oh, we're going to go first. So, some of you drive 45 minutes to an hour. Because in your heart, you're like, there's something here. Let me tell you what it is. It's fire. And I'm not talking about Alicia Keys. Uh, hear me, I'm not talking about momentum, I'm not talking about hustle, I'm not talking about swag, I'm talking about glory. I'm talking about the real deal. The Lord brought me to Leviticus chapter 6 verse 12. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it 
It's one thing to have the fire. It's another thing to allow the fire to burn. Oh, I'm going to mess with that in the next service. It shall not be put out. Look at verse, the next verse. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order on it. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. Watch this. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. The fire shall never go out. And I'm here to prophesy, decree, and declare that as long as we have wood, we'll have fire. As long as somebody is willing to throw the piece of worship, to throw a, a praise, to throw a prayer, to throw a dance on the altar, there will always be fire on the inside of this house. Is there anybody in this room that will join me before we leave this morning and give God something to burn, give God something to ignite? God, here's my hands. Here's my voice. Here's my worship. Here's my prayer.